My name is Greg. I'm a consultant. I'm a principal consultant here at uh, Hack Collective. These are KPIs. So I put, there are three KPI visualizations that uh, I personally like, or um, you know, I shouldn't, Microsoft calls only the one in the middle here a KPI, meaning that it's taking a number and it's comparing it over a time period to another number. But I think in common business communications, we refer to KPIs as being individual numbers. This is a key performance indicator. So I think that describing that key performance indicator just in one box right here is frankly very useful sometimes. I do think that color coding it according to some goal or threshold adds additional usefulness. So even though we have the card visualization right here, I think that there are two other ones that are, um, I would say slightly superior. So the first one, this is Microsoft's built-in KPI visualization. It allows me to take one number and then say, uh, so like a forecast or a budget and compare it against it. Then it will, it will even spark line the trend over some axis. So I think time is the obvious axis to put in here. And so it will show me a spark line of, you know, let's say that this is our uh, unit sold number. This is showing me in the background how many units have been sold. So I can kind of see, hey, is this, you know, trending upward, trending downward? Only show people that, that piece of information you're trying to convey. So the only thing they were trying to convey here was the trend in the background. So they don't give us axes, they don't give us anything fancy. They just show us what they want to. And then it allows me to compare that over time against some sort of goal. Um, but I can compare it to any goal. So these numbers or measures are independently vary and it will show me, hey, you were, you know, right at your goal, you missed it by this much or you exceeded it by this much and that uh, equates to this percentage. I think that these are extremely useful. One thing that is important to mention about this, and this is a little bit more on the business side than the reporting side, is threshold number that like, hey, if I'm above this, I'm green. If I'm below this, I'm red. That number needs to be decided upon by the business. There needs to be business buy-in to the decision around those thresholds, because ideally these numbers are then used to run the company. So if financially we know that we set this target, we've budgeted this amount, that really should be the number that gets used. And that's really how business decision and reporting feed back into one another. So the reporting is not just a one-way street. The business is making decisions that feed back into the reporting so that we get this virtuous cycle of better questions, better answers, and hopefully consistently increasing performance. Now, the last one, this is a custom card visualization. Um, that I got on the uh, Microsoft Marketplace, the visualization marketplace. This one's made by OKViz. OK and the reason why I like this and chose to include this is that it allows me to do multiple states. So instead of this one, which is just basically like yay or nay, this one over here gives me the ability to set, say, multiple conditions. And so I really like the ability to specify multiple different states. So that's why I included that one in here as well. The next one that I wanna show is the waterfall i there i've seen people who do um you know other fancy things with waterfalls i think that they uh do tend to be um really really neat as you can see in the example that i have right here this is the, the adventure works data set for those of you who are familiar with it it's you know just all about bikes and we can see okay well uh, you know year over year uh, over a year, we can see which of our products contributed to the most amount of sales. I think that this is the best way to combine time series with comparative breakout. One of the other ways that I love to use this is for price volumes analysis. Price volume mix allows me to do attribution. It's one of the forms of root cause analysis. So price volume mix is a structured way and then waterfalls tend to be the best way to communicate it. This is again, another really, really powerful tool for being able to make financial decisions for the company. And it allows us to really actively engage with our, you know, how we're going to market with our pricing strategy. Um, you know, the volume and the mix are extremely helpful with distribution and handing that information off to operations. Um, the, the price volume mix analysis is extremely, extremely valuable. The Power BI matrix visualization, I remember when you know, Power BI was was still in its youth. This was, you know, a pretty hacky version of a pivot table. I now look at it as uh, frankly being uh, vastly superior 
to a pivot table with the the amount of customization and the way that you can get um, its interactivity with other visualizations, things like that. Just basically combining this uh, pivot table functionality with all of the other inherent functionality of Power BI really makes it a powerhouse for financial analysis. Um, you know, I, the the key thing that I imagine is taking this kind of P and L item and then looking at it with like a, a map. So say you're, you know, a multinational and you have this map or you know, even even a national company in the United States, you broke it out by states, um, you know, having the ability to click on a particular area and then boom, hey, here's a version of my P&L just for that area. That's unbelievably powerful. Just that type of one click. We didn't have power like that um, really before Power BI. The matrix. Um, I, I can only presume that that most people who use Power BI are familiar with the matrix visualization, um, but they may not be familiar with some of the considerations around using the matrix visualization for financial reporting, in particular for something like a P&L or a balance sheet. So uh, a P&L and a balance sheet, they typically have uh, very standardized structures, especially if you're going after this kind of grid. Um, people have an expectation of what that's going to look like. One of the other key things that I will say about this is it is a, a balancing act between how how rigidly we want to stick to that, that format and that structure. Um, or both on the back end and the front end, right? So how much technical debt do I want to accrue in order to just get like spaces in between lines? The flip side is um, on the front front end. So I, I included some of the heat mapping things that we can do here. Um, it can be a little bit difficult to make sure that the, you know, all those different lines, which all mean very different things, are heat mapped or uh, you know, have KPIs next to them that are that are accurate, but you can add a huge amount of value by doing things like that. That brings me to the next point. That is the table visualization. So this is significantly less flexible than the matrix visualization. So the table visualization is pretty much, you just, you, you know, you put stuff in there, it generates this big brick, but there's none of that uh, subtotaling like child to parent behavior that I really think is necessary to make standardized kind of traditional financial statements or accounting statements. The table, in my mind, has a different use of financial reporting. Tables are a great way to show maybe like a large amount of information and then use other visualizations to filter them down. So that then by the time I get to this table visualization, there's only a, a few records in here and it's now digestible and provides me that view into the low level of granularity. So when I'm able to structure a report that balances the high level visibility of something like a KPI with the low level interrogation capabilities of something like a table. So this type of blend uh, of really high level and low level granularity and providing a filtering path to get from one to the other is really where I think the table shines, showing off transactional detail at the end of an investigation. One particular third party uh, visualization maker that I thought needed to be called out in this sphere Basically, I know that there are some companies that are averse to additional spending, you know, not comfortable with something that doesn't come from somebody as, you know, reputable as Microsoft. Um, but I really think that the Zebra BI visualizations that they have here, there's two versions, a table version and a chart version are really, really powerful. They have um, built in abilities that really, really help with making a P&L. Their table uh, visualization does a fantastic job with making P&Ls because it can show you the change and the percent change period over period, which is kind of a really neat ad. Um, they're pretty dynamic. So the the upside is just that they are extremely customizable, right? They're custom visualizations. But the downside is, is that the full capabilities require paid licensure. Um, and sometimes even require working with Zebra BI to do customization of the visuals. Or you really, really want to make like very customized, um, kind of like traditional with a modern take uh, accounting statements. This may be something that's worth looking at. Next, we have a couple honorable mentions here as I wrap up. Any visualization, it's not really a visualization itself, but no visualization or uh, report is complete without the need to slice and interact with it. So whether you're doing that with the slicer visualization or you're doing that with um, other visualizations and using cross filtering, uh, the ability to dig into your data 
is is critical. So slicers just have to be mentioned. Um, the next is, uh, this takes a little bit of, of digging and thinking, but this is another way towards root cause analysis called a decomposition tree. Um, I there uh, It's a newer visualization within Power BI. I think that for me, the waterfall does a better job and is more accessible to people, but I have seen decomposition trees that do a great job with root cause analysis if they're well thought out. Uh, maps, so not uh, a traditional staple of financial reporting, but I think that as we've talked about kind of the the capabilities and technology that are currently available have moved what financial and accounting reporting really look like, um, especially for internal use. Um, I think maps are starting to become really critical. I think being able to see if there are geographic trends, um, things like that, things that won't pop out to anybody um, in that kind of grid format, they may pop out in a map. And again, they're a great way to cross filter. Um, and then last but not least, the, the column and the line is, uh, you know, a fine visualization for, for purpose built items. But the thing that I really wanted to call out here is doing a custom Pareto. Now in Power BI, Paredos are uh, obnoxiously difficult. Um, there is not a good custom visualization that I've come across that does it. Um, so you kind of have to do it the hard way. It requires a lot of difficult DAX. I, I will be totally uh, forthright with you. Uh, but when you pull them off, they are, uh, if you're not familiar with a Pareto, it's a, a very specific column and line chart and they're set out in a specific way. And what it allows us to do is kind of like iteratively focus on cost, waste, uh, brokenness in some fashion. Um, th these originally came out of um, you know, kind of the, the lean movement, the just in time movement, or the Toyota production system. Um, if anybody's seen Office Space, that the Toyota production system, TPS, re TPS reports. Um, so the Pareto is one of the visuals that came out of that. There are a lot of people that, uh, you know, love consuming Paredos. Um, and I think that they're a great way to look at, um, you know, again, like a root cause analysis. It's something that you can drill down into and will give you really that information. Um, and then last but not least is a, a quick discussion about what not to use. For whatever reason, the pie chart, like when people think of visualizations, they think of pie charts. Um, I think that that is because, you know, Excel and PowerPoint and things like that were like, you know, generating these for a while, but they're, they're really bad. And a donut is the same thing just with the center missing. So the reason why I don't like these is the same reason why I don't like stacked bars and columns down at the bottom. And that's because it's very, very difficult to talk uh, accurately about the relative amount of something. So I can look at it and I can say, well, that's bigger than that, or that looks about the same as that. And very similar with the gauge. The gauge um, sometimes can be neat for like a fun KPI thing. But as far as like doing detailed financial analysis, I don't think that any of these have the rigor to be able to accurately communicate small differences, which typically matter a lot in financial situations. So uh, that's why I stay. go ahead and stay away from these if you can. Um, thank you guys all so much for, for listening and for um, giving me the opportunity to present.